Well, I have been in California now, I think, for 14 years, but I still consider myself a Midwest boy um, at heart. And there's just some things about the weather I don't understand with you guys out here. I just I don't really get it. Like, I always, I always want to wear socks and shoes. I hate sandals. I just hate them together. But you guys, you love your sandals. And one thing I don't get with guys is they, wear, they will wear sandals and shorts and then like a winter coat when it's cold. I don't get that. Like, why not just wear pants and a long sleeve shirt rather than that? But I, it's what you guys do with the weather out here. The weather's just kind of crazy. It's a lot different than the Midwest. But one thing I've noticed this summer, I don't know if you've thought it, I feel like it's a little cooler than it was last summer. It's been nice. It's been relatively not that hot. Because I remember last summer, I think during July, it started to get really hot and there were some wildfires that were happening in July. Because I was looking at my uh, illustrations file that I have and I pulled one out and it was back from July 2018. It was this, I think, wildfire that was going through uh, Santa Barbara area, somewhere around there. And it had gone through and like decimated a town. And they had an account of a couple that lost their house. Uh, newly married couple. They had just gotten married, I think, eight months ago. And they said the ritual every night was for the wife to go take her new wedding ring and put it on the counter, and then she'd go to bed. Uh, but as soon as she put the ring on the counter, they got the phone call that the wildfires are coming. So when you get that call, you have minutes to get out of the house, and they grabbed everything, and in the hustle and bustle of getting out of the house, she did not grab her wedding ring and thought it got torched with the whole house. So they come back, I can't remember how many days later, but they come back to the area, and just imagine walking up on the scene where you used to see your house, and it's gone, right? The fire engulfed everything, and there's just ash and destruction and all of this uh, horrible stuff that you see before you. But they had the hope that maybe... They could find the wedding ring. So they were there and they were digging between the different areas that they saw at the house. And the husband actually bent down in a certain area, saw a little glimmer, dusted it off, and it was the wedding ring. He found it. His wife came over. He actually bent down on one knee again and gave it to her again, kind of symbolizing that. And this is what she said when that happened. She said, when he did that, when he got down on one knee again and put the ring on my finger, he, she said, it put everything into perspective. It took all the pain away and reminded me of what really matters in this life the people around you. That perspective change of being able to find that little glimmer of hope and for that to wake you up to see amidst all the destruction, you have that perspective change. You know what life is about because that happened. I think we have something very similar in Mark chapter 14 this morning. Would you turn with your Bibles in, uh, with me to Mark chapter 14? And I'm going to read a section for you. And at the beginning and the end, there is this horrible tragedy, this destruction, this dismay but there's a little glimmer of hope right in the middle, this, this little glimpse of beauty. And when we understand that glimpse of beauty, it changes the perspective on everything. And I think we know what we're here for. Mark chapter 14, we're going to look at the first 11 verses. Mark 14, 1 to 11. You can follow along as I read. It was now two days before the Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, he was reclining at a table. A woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment, of pure nard, very costly. She broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some there who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you will always have the poor with you and whenever you want, you can do good to them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body before the burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, who went to the chief priest in order to betray him to him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money, and he sought an opportunity to betray him. Do you see that in the midst of this, this dastardly plan and destruction, that little glimmer of beauty in the act of worship that this woman gives to Jesus? That, when we understand that, puts everything into perspective and begins to show us how we need to make sure we live in order to honor Jesus Christ the way that he wants us to. 
So I think this morning is going to be a a good morning for us to take a look at what real, genuine worship of Jesus Christ is, what it means to be his disciple. And it is to give him that that singular focus, that, that worship that he alone deserves and no one else. He has no rivals in this sense. And I hope we'll be able to walk away from that. But if you were with us last time, you remember we took like a master's class in end times eschatology study of what's going to go on at the end of the world. The good thing for us is Jesus tells us he wins. He's in control. He's going to work all things out according to the counsel of his will. He has his plans, his promises. He will be faithful. You can trust him even though it, it can look bad at times. But you as his disciples, your only job, just watch. Be watchful, alert. Don't fall into the patterns of this world, but be anticipating my coming. We want to be those people who love his appearing, who long for him to come back, who cry out with John, come quickly, Lord Jesus, because we want to be with you. But until then, we are left here to worship him. How do we do that? We'll take a look at this. We have that scene. We got that little time marker, 14.1. It is now two days before the Passover. And Mark clearly, since about the middle of the book, stopped being general with time. And he's now being very specific because he wants you to know where we are in relegation to the end of Jesus's life. So we're two days before. We're at the Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which means there are tons and scores of people in Jerusalem. There's ceremonies, sacrifices, rituals, traditions, everything going on. And there are a ton of people there. And all those people... They really seem to like Jesus. That's why we see the chief priests and the scribes here taking a little step back because they really want to get rid of Jesus. They know his power. They know what he's here to do. They know that his rule ends their rule in the lives of the people. So they want to get rid of him. But they go, well, hold on a second. I can't just come kill the most popular guy in Jerusalem right here and now. Remember, Jesus is doing all these mighty works and the people are astonished because he's, you know, healing blind men and bringing people back from the dead. And they're like, wow, this is amazing. And actually the crowds hear his teaching and they go, oh, what you're saying is is really good. Now we talked about the difference between astonishments and uh, allegiance, but still there's a popularity with Jesus with the people. So for them to go kill Jesus right now would mean they're probably going to have a riot on their hands. And the Jewish leaders cannot afford that because they're put there to kind of make sure that nothing goes out of place amongst those people. The Roman government is making sure that that happens. They don't want to ride on their hands, so they don't want to lose any power that they have with the people. So they're thinking, okay, let's do this clandestinely. Let's see if we can't find a way to subtly capture Jesus and get rid of him. This is the son of God. You realize that when we confess Jesus, the God-man, this is God himself coming to earth And these people are trying to kill him. It seems like a pretty dark scenario. But then we have a little glimmer of light in verse 3. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at a table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. What beauty we have right there. This is Jesus receiving what he should. Undivided undistracted, unadulterated devotion from someone. That is what it means to be God. You get all the worship, all the fame, all the credit, everything. And it all goes to you. And that's what Jesus is receiving from this woman. It's really going to help us this morning to take a look at that, to make sure that that's the type of devotion we're given to Christ. But before we do that, did you see that there was a reaction of the people around her? Take a look at that, verse 5 or verse 4. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. See, there is something that will distract us from the pure devotion of Jesus Christ. That's when we forget who he is and what he's come to do. And then that allows us to put ourselves in a place and a status that we don't have the right to to take. And that's the status of judge. You see these people judging and condemning this woman for the act that she's doing to Jesus Christ. They said this indignantly, but did you notice, to themselves, right on the inside. They have this judgment of what's going on right there. And that type of judgment is going to distract us from the worship of Jesus Christ. So if you want to write this down, number one, in your outline, to make sure that we're worshiping Jesus the way that we should, write it down this way. Let's avoid prideful judgments. We must avoid prideful judgments. We cannot be prideful and be worshipers of Jesus Christ. Those two things don't go together. I think it was C.S. Lewis, and I'm going to butcher the quote, but if you Google something similar to this, uh, prideful people are always looking down on others. And as long as you are looking down on others, you cannot look up. And if you can't look up, then who can you not see? Jesus Christ, who is all glorious in that sense. So we have these people making these prideful judgments on this woman right here. 
And notice how it's distracting from the devotion that we should be giving to Jesus Christ. I'm struck by the phrase, they said to themselves indignantly. You have that problem? You can put on a nice front on the outside and you can talk to people, oh, it's great to see you here at church today. But do you have that temptation to judge them internally? Say that to yourselves? Question what they're doing? Demean what they're doing? Talk bad about what they're doing? Does that go on in your heart and your mind? Because the moment you forget who Jesus is and what he's come to do, then that's very easy for you to step into that role. Because then you become the judge of the universe and how things affect you and what happens to you. That becomes the main thing. And we have to avoid that if we're going to be pure worshipers of Jesus Christ. But these people here are not doing it. Interesting note though here. This was said to be, if you noticed, in the house of Simon the leper. Who is this guy? Simon the leper. Commentators are split. They don't really know. There's a couple different theories. One, this might be a leper that Jesus has healed, right? We've already seen him heal a bunch of lepers. Maybe he's just having him over because now that he doesn't have the leprosy anymore, he can have fellowship with people because he's not an outcast. Other people think that maybe just because there's other Simons in the book, like Simon Peter, maybe they're just putting that as a designation just to make sure you don't get confused. But there was one that I found very interesting, and I, th I think it has some weight to it. Turn with me to John chapter 12. Turn to John 12. Matthew Mark, Luke, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels because they tell a very similar story. They look at Jesus from very similar angles. And you often see a lot of the, the very same um, interactions that Jesus has with people, like our stories and I think Matthew as well. But John doesn't follow that strict nature or chronology at points in times and doesn't always have the same stories. In fact, he has different ones. But here in John chapter 12, verses, uh, let's see, one to, set, one to eight, I think we have the same story that's going on in ours. Let's read it. John chapter 12, verse one, it says, six days before the Passover, uh, it, it was six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus raised from the dead. So they gave him a so they gave him a dinner for him there. Martha served. Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary, therefore, took a pound of ex expensive ointment made of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said it not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. I think these are the similar accounts. Now you do notice that this says six days before. And at the beginning of Mark 14, you have two days before. But notice that that was just discussing what the chief priests and the scribes were doing. It shifted scenes in verse three to something else, which I think is just Mark looking back into the week and he's bookending these destructive, dishonest, deceptive sections with this beautiful act of worship to show us the type of devotion we need to give to Jesus Christ. And so I think the unnamed woman then would be Mary because you look at a lot of the similar details that are going on in there in that sense. So it gives us a little insight. Then some commentators assume, and I think they might be right, that Simon the leper could have been related to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus at that point in time. But whatever you take, I just, I want you to have that because we'll, we'll reference that back later on. Go back to Mark chapter 14 so we can talk a little bit more about avoiding these prideful judgments. Because you saw that here in this text, it says some of the people there. We know the ringleader probably was Judas because we just read that in John chapter 12. Judas is the one coming and saying, listen, this is a waste of time. You shouldn't do that. Why are you doing that? We could have given this to the poor, but really he had some more prideful motives, some very heinous motives behind that. But here we have other people who are at least joining with him who are saying to themselves indignantly. Do you remember that word in Mark before? Indignantly. It was back in Mark chapter 10. So we got the disciples going with Jesus on the road, he's telling them, hey guys, I'm going to the cross. I'm gonna be the ransom for many. I have to die so people can come into heaven. I have to rise again three days later to show that I am the son of God. That's all gonna happen. I have to suffer these things. They're on the way and then two guys come up, James and John, and we learn from another gospel um, that their mom comes with them as well. That makes you feel really masculine that your mom goes to Jesus and says, what do I gotta do to get my two boys to have the two best seats in the house there? Do you remember the reaction of the other disciples? The other disciples heard that these two were asking for the best seats in the house and they were indignant with James and John. This means there's like an anger, a scorn, 
That's what these people are doing to this woman inside their minds. And notice the type of reasoning that they're giving. Why was this ointment wasted? They have just made this this act of worship. They have judged it as a waste, which in other contexts is a word used for destruction, but here just used as a waste. Like this accomplished nothing. This didn't do anything. Why would you waste what is so valuable? How can they make that judgment? Jesus is sitting right there. The son of God who's about to sacrifice himself for the sins of the people, they're looking at that going, what a waste this is. They got some pride in them. They got some judgments that's coming from them. Now notice how they couch it, how they cover it up, they mask it. For this could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. So it sounds like, oh, these people, they're they're really caring. They're considering the poor there in that sense. And you notice how prideful judgments can kind of mask themselves in these good deeds at that point in time? Oh, we could have done so much for the poor for this. And is it good to do things for the poor? Well, according to the Old Testament, absolutely. Right, that was one of the heights of Jewish piety, of of an Israelite being able to show that he really believed and trusted in God, that he took care of the poor. Like you were to to work your field, but you weren't to, you know, glean all the way to the edges so that poor people and wanderers, they could just come up and take stuff off of the edge so they could help other people. Or Psalm 112 says, the righteous man is generous when he lends. He gives to the poor freely. It it is a good thing to do that. And these people are couching their prideful judgments in something good. It can be very, very dangerous. So I think you and I need to avoid it. I was watching a very interesting video yesterday about art forgeries. Have you seen that? You can, people make hundreds of millions of dollars on being able to forge an, an authentic piece of old art. And you have to be able to determine and detect, like, is this a forgery or not? So they'll bring it to these people. And some of the things that they look for are like materials or paints that were used in the painting that really appear before the original painting was there. So they have scanners and black lights and those types of things to be able to tell the forgery because you don't want to get duped and buy something that's, that's not real, that's not genuine. I think that's what we need to kind of do with, with this. Every time that we make this type of suggestion, oh yeah, we could do something for the poor with this. Are we really doing it for the right reasons and motivations? Have we been able to judge it properly? Because I think we don't pass judgment on other people, but it's very good for us to look on our own motives in that sense. And if you look at it, how are they making this judgment wrongly? They've detached the object of the worship from the act itself. And now I can judge it wrongly. So for us to make sure that we're doing things and we're evaluating them properly, always make sure that it's attached to the devotion of Jesus Christ. Notice they're saying nothing about him and everything about the act. That's all they're focused on. Why did she do that? Why did she do this? We could have done this with that, but they didn't connect it to Jesus in that sense. Very, very interesting. Now watch what happens, okay? More than 300 denarii, we'll talk about that in a moment, and given to the poor, they scold her. Now it comes external, okay? Now we're watching this prideful stuff that was going on inside of them. Now it's spewing out of them in that sense. Why do we need to avoid it? One, we won't be able to worship Jesus Christ if we're putting ourselves in the judgment seat. It just doesn't happen that way. But do you know that nothing will stop the unity of the church more than passing judgment on one another? Why don't you turn with me to James chapter four? I think we just gotta avoid this, guys. Make sure we don't do this. James chapter four. Think about this with me. We studied the book of James, one of the early books we looked at. James chapter four, verses 11 and 12 speak to this. Watch how they kind of separate. James is talking about this, how they're able to make these type of judgments. They're gonna separate the act from the actual judge himself. And I'm able to do that if I, if I don't include him in my thought process. James 4, 11 says this. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks evil against the brother, here we go, or judges his brother, speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? You see, James has a lot of conflict going on in his book. Could be between the rich and the poor, uh, amongst the dispersion that he's writing to. But they're, they're backbiting against one another, they're judging one another's motives. How are they able to do that? because they've forgotten the one lawgiver and judge who has the right to do all of that, and they're assuming that role themselves. I can pass this judgment on you. 
James says, well, until on your resume it says you're the one lawgiver and judge who's able to save or to destroy, you don't have the right to cast condemnation or prideful judgments on others. See, James is a lot about unity. And one of the ways that our church is going to remain unified is if we never get into this arena where we come to church where it's supposed to be the undistracted, unadulterated, undivided worship of Jesus Christ because we started passing judgments on one another. And sometimes it's not external with the scorn that came in the text. Sometimes it's just internal, but we got to make sure that that never, ever happens. If you think you're immune to that temptation, please, I beg you, don't. Because it can be such a, a fungus, a gangrene that can just latch hold of the church and hurt it. We don't want to be like that. Or turn to Romans. Turn to Romans 14. This is not just a problem with, with uh, one another there in James. Romans 14. In the section talking about liberties, like what somebody has the right to do. Nothing's going to hurt the unity of the church more than if we start to judge others' freedoms in Christ. Romans 14, verses 1 through 6, speaks again of not passing judgment on one another, the scorn or contempt. Watch what it says right here. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes that he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let the one who eats despise the one, let, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. Watch this. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. See, that's again understanding God's role or Christ's role. We stand before one judge, one master. And we try to live according to his rules. We're not trying to live up to one another's standards. And when it comes to that, if we're in the position of just kind of judging one another's liberties in that sense, we don't want to do that because they're standing before their own master. Take a look at verse 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. That's the one that matters. You're standing before God. That's the one who has the right to pass judgment. He's the one who can save and destroy. It's up to him. But now in all of this, please don't hear me saying this, that we don't think critically or we don't evaluate or we don't help one another by thinking through issues and encouraging one another to make sure that we have the pure devotion of Jesus Christ. To sit down and talk to a a brother or sister in Christ who, who might be in sin is not a judgment in that sense from you passing that judgment on to them. What it is, is you hopefully humbly going and saying, listen, the standard of our master is this. I don't think you're living according to that standard. I want to help you to get back to that standard. Is a lot different than passing judgment because I don't think you did the right thing according to my standard. Those are two different things. One extricates Christ and God from the seat of judgment. The other one has God and Christ right where they need to be. Hey, this is God's word and I think this is clear and I think you not doing that uh, means you're, you're in sin. And that's, that's not a judgment in that sense uh, of being prideful moving on. So I think there's a distinction right there. In fact, Jesus himself in John chapter seven said that you should judge with right judgments. There should be a standard for you to be able to kind of look and evaluate things. It's just not up to you to come up with your own and then cast dispersions on those when they don't live up to that standard. That's pride and that's gonna destroy. That's what I think's going on here in Mark 14. If you wanna head back there, Mark 14. Really do that, guys. Really think like, okay, if I'm gonna sit down with this person, is this a judgment that I'm not met my standard or is it really Christ? Because it should be clear from the scriptures and if it's clear from the scriptures, then we should want to hear that. I should want to hear that. If I'm, if I'm doing something that's not honoring to Christ, well, then he's the one that I'm gonna stand before. So I wanna make sure that I'm living according to his word. That's different than a prideful judgment like coming from these people. How were they able to do that? I'm saying they detached the act from the object that it's devoted to, Jesus Christ. And I think we see that in the text. Look what Jesus does in this, verse six. After they scolded her, Jesus stands up. I love this. Leave her alone. And why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Now, do you understand how Christ can make that shift? They have detached the object of worship and they're just focusing on the act and they're casting aspersion on it. Christ brings himself back into it and says, she's done a beautiful thing to who? To me. Now we have the right way to evaluate what she's done. 
because she's doing it to the one person who is worthy to receive all devotion, Jesus Christ, worthy of all worship, all honor. So when you put Christ back where he should be, it sets everything right. And it allows us now to understand what real genuine worship is. It's when you evaluate things and you give Christ that, that singular focus of your heart. So why don't I write this down number two on our outlines. Remember worship's singular focus. If you're gonna worship Jesus Christ the way that he is worthy of worship, remember that cannot be divided. Jesus himself told us no one can serve two masters. And Mary here is showing us that she's ready to, to worship Jesus Christ. She wants to devote everything to him. What a beautiful gift she does. What a, what a great example she shows us of a worshiper of Jesus Christ. You know one thing that you can say about her? Does she really care about the opinions of others? Not really. I mean, she's just happy to worship the Savior. She's happy to worship Jesus because she knows him. She knows what he's gonna do. She knows who he truly is and, and, and what is worthy of him. She's just happy to do that and give it to Jesus. Let's talk a little bit about the gift that she gave. So notice this, it's an alabaster flask. It's got ointment in it, it's pure nard, which is probably an ointment that came from around India, very expensive because we have it in the text, very costly. And watch these acts that she does. She breaks the flask and pours it over his head. What a symbolic move that is. I mean, think about that. You have this alabaster flask, which possibly could have been a family heirloom maybe passed down from generation to generation. We're not exactly sure, but that could have been something in the family that they had passed down to one another. And it contains this, this ointment that's so expensive. She could have taken that flask, poured a little bit out in her hand and rubbed a little bit on Jesus and been okay. Like, hey, that's a nice thing to do. You anointed a guest who's right there. But she doesn't do that. She goes to the extreme. She breaks it. Right? Think about that symbolic act of, of breaking everything. That means everything that is in here is yours. Okay? Nothing is left to me. I'm expending it all for you, Jesus, because you are the one who is worthy. This is a great act of devotion, and Jesus Christ is the only one worthy of that act of devotion. And we have from John's account how it went from his head all the way down to his feet, and she took her hair, the woman's symbol of glory, and wipes Jesus' feet with it. This is just an extravagant, over-the-top, opulent gift that she's given to Jesus as she does that. Do you notice again what they said it cost? 300 denarii? Think about that with me. So denarii, day's wage in the Bible. You go to work, doing things that the Jews did back in the Old Testament, working for a day, and you'd get a denarii. This ointment was worth over 300 denarii. So 300 days wage. If you take that and you take out the Sabbath days in a year, and I think a Jewish calendar is around 360 days at the time, that's 52 Sabbaths that you take out. That's about 308 days, right? If I'm doing my math right. So that's a year worth of denarii that this ointment is worth. So she's taking a year's salary and throwing it on Jesus to honor him in that sense. Think of the extravagance. Like imagine right now you went to your company and you just said, hey, my next paycheck send it all to the church or send it all to a missionary. I don't want it. I just want the, the worship of Jesus Christ to spread, so send it all there. Like people would look at you like you're crazy. Why would you do that in that sense? That's what this woman is doing. And now there's speculation that this is probably part of the dowry that she would have had if she got married. So that was part of the money that was gonna be included in the ceremony that was gonna go on and she's breaking that over Jesus' head to show him how much she loves him and how much she thinks he needs to be honored. What a beautiful gift she's giving in that sense. So Jesus says, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. That's instructive for us. Everything we do should be devoted to Christ. What does Paul say? For me to live is Christ. That's what it's about as a Christian. Everything that I have, I want it to be devoted to you. If I go to work today, I'm living for Christ. If I get to spend the day with my family, I'm spending it for Christ. If, I, if I'm going through a trial, I'm doing it for Christ because it's all for Christ. That's what worship of Jesus is. It's a singular devotion. He doesn't divide it with anybody else, nor should he have to, being the king of the universe. See that word beautiful? It's a great word. Remember we saw this back in Mark, I think it was seven where it says, Jesus does all things well. That word well, same word as beautiful here. So Jesus does all things well, 
And now his followers are able to do these beautiful things in act of service to the Savior. What a privilege that is. She's doing this beautiful thing to me. Now, very interesting in verse 7, though, we kind of have a transition there. Because Jesus goes, for you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good to them, but you will not always have me. People could take that like, whoa, Jesus, are you now saying like, we shouldn't help the poor? Like, what's going on here in that sense? But if you notice very carefully, it's not a contrast between should I do something to the poor or should I not, but it's who are you going to have with you longer? It's, it's about time. The poor is always going to be here. And I think that's a direct quote from Deuteronomy 15.1. You know that the poor are always going to be in the land, and you can always do things if you want to take care of them. But they have a very unique opportunity right now. Remember, this is the incarnation. The incarnation of Jesus Christ, the the second person of the Trinity coming down in the flesh, only being here for a short period of time in his first coming. And you have that short window to show the devotion that you want to show to Jesus. When you get into eternity, you're not always going to have me with you. You got to wait till I come back. So nothing is too extreme for Jesus. It's given him this this great gift. For the poor you always have, you you can do good to them but you will not always have me. So Jesus isn't trying to, trying to do that. He's trying to say, hey, go take care of them, but remember, I'm only here for a short time. Then I love this phrase right here, she has done what she could. That tells us more about this worship. It's about giving what you have. See, different people have different means and different abilities. We're not all called to do the same thing. A very similar phrase actually appeared a few chapters ago. Can you go back with me to uh, chapter 12, verse 41? That's the story of the, the widow giving those two cents, right? On the two mites. And the phrase very similar to what Jesus has said here appears. Let me read it for you. Mark 12, 41 to 44. Watch this. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came up and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples and said to them, truly I say to you, this poor woman has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had. You see that last phrase, she had? That's the same phrase as she could in our text. So remember when we were back here, I told you there's split between people who think this is a section of condemnation on the temple or a commendation of what the woman is giving the sacrificial giving, the giving of everything, meaning what it means to be a disciple in that sense. And at the time I told you, I'm leaning a little bit more towards it was a commendation from Jesus to her in that sense. But now as I read this passage and I connect it to the, the, the offering of the ointment, I think I'm more convinced that it's commendation. Here's why. Look at this. Jesus is not comparing this to the temple system that he just condemned in the chapter. Who's he comparing it with? The rich people. He's just talking about rich people who have a lot of money and they're given a little bit of money, but it's, it's not a real big sacrifice for them. Like if you have a $100 million salary and you give $50,000 to the church, people are like, whoa, $50,000 is incredible. That is nothing if you have a $100 million salary. But this woman comes and gives literally everything she has the same way that Mary, who I'm saying is in the text, gives everything that she has. Now here's the beautiful thing about it. If that's the case and that's the interpretation, It shows you, you just give what you have. God's not requiring anything of you other than what he's blessed you with to give. So whether you have a lot or a little, it matters the purity of devotion, the singular devotion to Jesus Christ. It's about that relationship. That's how you evaluate what something is worth. It's not necessarily the monetary value. You can think about it this way. Uh, This past Father's Day, I got got a couple gifts. My wife was very kind to me. She uh, got me this mug. I love it. It's a coffee mug, and I love coffee. Coffee that is just straight black, not sullied by creamer or sugar. It's just so good to drink, just straight black. But I have to have hot coffee. If I have lukewarm coffee, spit it out of my mouth, okay? I learned that from Jesus, right? Lukewarm things, keep them out of your mouth. I don't want anything to do with that. So I'm just trying to follow the Bible. So this cup, actually, it's tied to an app on my phone, keeps it at the temperature I want it, and it will not drop. It's battery powered at the bottom. It's a very nice gift. My wife was very kind to me to to spend that money on me. I also got something else uh, on Father's Day. I got it from one of my boys. I don't know if you can see that right there. If you know me, that looks like my handwriting, but it's not, okay? It's one of my son's handwriting. But listen to this. This is what it said. It gave it to me on Father's Day. I love you, Dad. You are fun. I love you so much, okay? It's from one of my boys. 
Now, which one of those two gifts is worth more? Monetarily speaking, the mug that's going to heat up the coffee and keep it there is worth more than a piece of paper. But if you ask me which gift is worth more, what am I going to say? I'm going to say the one for my son because it's about the relationship. You could ask me, Pastor Elliot, you have one choice. You get to keep one of those two things. What are you going to keep? I 100% am I going to keep this all day long because it's about the relationship that we have to one another in the same way with Christ. It's about what we give to him, not, not about the, the amount of it or, or anything to do with it. It's about giving that singular, unhindered, unadulterated, undivided devotion to him. And whatever that looks like, whatever you have, you just give it. And Christ is going, she gave what she had. And in the other section, she gave what she had. And they're both commendations of those two things. I think that's what we see going on here. Go back to Mark 14. Mark 14. She gave what she had. She did a beautiful thing. Then the, this very interesting phrase, she's anointed my body before the burial. Wow, that's, a, that's an in-depth statement. Jesus is now talking about his death on the cross, right? To come die for the sins of the people. This has to take place, Jesus said. There is no other way to unite sinful humanity with a holy God other than this perfect sacrifice. So I have to go do that. She's anointing my body before this burial. And people ask, did she know that she was doing that? Well, to me, if this is Mary, and I think it's Mary, I think she did. Some people say no, but I think she did. Why do I say that? What do you know about Mary as you read through the Gospels? Can you write down Luke chapter 10 for me? Luke 10, 38 to 42. Luke chapter 10, 38 to 42. We won't turn there just because uh, for the sake of time. Luke 10, 38 to 42. And that's the story of Mary and Martha and Jesus coming. Mary and Martha are having Jesus over. Martha's the one doing everything, right? I'm doing everything. I'm working, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. And she sees Mary, who's over there, and has Jesus teaching, and Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. So Martha comes and goes, Jesus, can't you tell Mary to come help me? I've got too many things to do. And what does Jesus say? Martha, Martha, Mary's chosen the one thing necessary. Mary listens when Jesus teaches Mary has this devotion to Jesus. She understands what's going on here. I think there's a good chance she knows that in a few days he's going to die. And she's trying to do the best she can to honor him with all that she has, which is the call of the disciple to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus with everything. I think she's a great picture of that here. She's anointed my body beforehand. Now notice what happens when you do that, okay? That can sound extreme, but notice verse 9. And truly, just the same way that he said about the widow's mites, and truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed, in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. That is such a great statement to show you what the worship of Jesus Christ gets you. Commendation from Christ. Is there anything else in the world that you want other than for Christ to look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Wouldn't that be worth any sacrifice you made for him? Jesus is here saying now, anytime that the gospel is told, this act of sacrifice is going to be communicated in memory of this woman. And seeking that type of commendation is what you want. In fact, there's a troubling line. I, I shudder every time I read it at the end of John 12. There's a group of Pharisees and they go, I think Jesus is the one, but you know what? I'm not going to say it out loud. I'm not going to confess it. And here's this phrase, because they love the glory that came from men rather than the glory that comes from God. And that's really the distinction between a Christian and a non-Christian. Do I love the praise of men or do I long to glorify God and then in his grace receive the commendation that comes from God for serving him? That is what you want. That is what you were created for. That is what gives you purpose for Jesus to look at you and commend what you are doing. What did he say? This woman's done a beautiful thing to me. What would that be like to hear Jesus say that to you? Does that drive you? I, I hope it does because that's, that's what the worship of Jesus Christ can do. Paul said something similar in 1 Corinthians 4 about the commendation that will come from God. What a moment that will be like in that sense. I know I've told you in here so far that I think that this is Mary, but we got to put ourselves in the, the shoes of the original readers who would have gotten this. So think about this for a moment. Mark's written in the mid-60s. Uh, and the Gospel of John is written late 80s, early 90s. So the people who are reading this for the first time 
are not going to have that account that we read of John in their minds. All they're going to get is this story right here. So as they receive that story, they have no idea who this woman is, only her beautiful act. And I was listening to a sermon this week on this text and what the, the preacher said struck me to my heart. So he was talking about this, the unnamed woman, and he said this, what if the only thing that was known about you is that you had extravagant devotion to Christ? Would that be worth it? And I thought, what a great question to ask yourself. Because I have to do that. You have to do that. What if that was the only thing known about you? And this woman right here at this point in time, that's all we know about her. Extravagant devotion to Christ. They love, she loves Jesus. Is that it for you? Would that be worth it? If you knew that Jesus was looking at you saying, that is a beautiful thing you are doing, that service, that sacrifice, I know it's hard, but man, that's a beautiful thing to me. Would that be worth it for you? I, I sure hope it is. But notice it doesn't stop there. It goes on to another section. But I don't want to miss this unadulterated devotion to Jesus. Why don't you turn with me to Philippians 3. Philippians chapter 3. Just so you know, that's, that's what it means to become a Christian. To become a Christian is to understand Jesus as the, the one who deserves that soul worship. The, the soul, singular, undivided attention of us. Philippians 3 is a familiar section. Philippians 3, 1 to 11, you know the first four verses where Paul is just saying, this is the stuff I could have boasted in and people would have boasted in me about. The praise of men would have come from this. I boasted in it. And all that good meant nothing to him in verse 7 when it says this. Watch this, Philippians 3, 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Those are the categories you have when you become a Christian. Pursuing Christ because you see the surpassing value of knowing him and everything else is rubbish. That's what it means. Whatever relationship is in your way, it cannot divide your devotion to Jesus Christ. Whatever job is in the way, it cannot divide. You have to have that devotion where you say, Jesus, you are worth it. Didn't we sing that? Give me Jesus, nothing else. That's what I want. That's the undistracted devotion we need to Christ. But notice as Christians, we're tempted to fall away from that, aren't we? Can you write down 2 Corinthians 11? Just write down 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 and 3. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 and 3 says this. For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent, serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Guys, that's why we come every week so we maintain that devotion to Christ. That's why I want you to be in small groups with one another. That's why I want you to care for one another so that nothing distracts you from that pure devotion to Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a, a Christian, to have that, that fully devoted, wholehearted uh, love for Jesus. So guys, please don't, don't get distracted by that. There are many things that can do that. Go back to uh, Mark to see one of them. We saw Judas before in Mark 12, or John 12, sorry. He was the one saying, man, this is a waste of time. We noticed that he had a love for money. And watch what we have in verse 10. After this beautiful display. Then Judas, who was one of the 12, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. Can you believe that, guys? This is Judas again. Judas is one of the 12. That shows us that proximity to Christ is not what it's about. It doesn't matter your closeness, proximity, right? It matters about the purity of your devotion. And what do we have here? Judas, who spent three years with Jesus, would betray him. If you've grown up in church, you know how much it was for, right? 30 pieces of silver. This woman's devotion is 300 a year's salary because Jesus, you're worth everything. And Judas goes for 30 pieces of silver to betray the Son of God. If you know any Old Testament, you read through the Old Testament, you know that 30 pieces of silver, you know what it was worth? 
the price of a slave, if you harm somebody else's slave, maybe you harmed them or maybe your animal gored them or something, you give somebody 30 pieces of silver in Exodus. And that's what Judas is getting for the life of the son of God. He loves money more than he loves Christ. And that cost him everything because he was chasing the wrong thing. You cannot chase two things. You have to be devoted to one. And by God's grace, we who are Christians have that singular devotion. Let's not be distracted in our love for Jesus Christ. I don't know if you've heard of this library. It's called the uh, Haskell Library, I believe. If I'm pronouncing that correctly. It is a library that sits on two countries. Part of it is in Canada and part of it is in the United States. So literally, there's, it's not uh, like halfway in between, but part of it is in um, America and part of it is over there in Canada. Assume the Canadian side is full of maple syrup and very polite people. Maybe it has a moose at the front desk. I don't know, just a lot of Canadian things. Maybe a hockey player over there. But then they have the American side right there. And they use it uh, as a way for people who are living on that border town to be able to kind of go back and forth, kind of be in between, um, between U.S. and Canada without having to go through like customs and borders to get over there in that sense. It was designed by a husband and wife. I think the husband was American and the wife was Canadian so that family members could be able to do that. I want you to know that between the kingdom of God, there's, there's nothing like that. There's nothing that allows you to kind of have a foot in both in that sense. That's a unique thing for this world to have uh, access to two countries. But when it comes to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of the world, there's no in between, right? It's an either you worship Christ or you don't. What I'm asking you is that, is there anything in your life right now that is distracting you from the devotion that Jesus Christ deserves? He deserves all honor and glory and praise. He is the lamb who was slain for our sins. And we don't be distracted by anything. If you're here and you're not a Christian, it's because you're chasing something else. There is something else that is dividing the attention that you should be given Jesus Christ. And to give that up, that's repentance. That's faith saying, I don't want that anymore. I want to follow Christ. So I'm asking you this morning, if you haven't made that decision, to make it for Christ. And you can be welcomed into his kingdom because of the gift of his son. But for us, who by his grace have been saved and have that opportunity to be devoted to him, let's live for him and give him those extravagant gifts and just long for him to say, that was a beautiful thing you did for me. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the worship that you allow us to give to you. You are worthy, God. And for you to be worthy means we should ascribe to you all that's there. Ascribe to the Lord, almighty ones. Ascribe to the Lord, honor and strength. Ascribe to the Lord, the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. God, we long to do that. There are certain things that will distract us, Father, because we get hung up um, with the things of this world. But I pray, Father, that there'd be such a a universal love for Christ here in this church that we would care and help one another stay devoted to him, offering him those gifts of sacrifice. The, the, like Romans 12 says, the offering ourselves as a, as a living sacrifice to God so that he would be pleased with us. God, thank you for what Christ has done for us. And God, we just ask that uh, he would be honored today with our words and our actions and we would give our whole hearts to him, Father. So please give us the strength to do that. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.